Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to today's Reckon Ausdocs webinar, The New Laws Equals New Opportunities. My name is Charlotte, and I'll be hosting today's webinar. Today's session will run for approximately 45 minutes with time for questions at the end. Questions can be submitted at any time in the question box on your webinar control panel. Our presenters today are Gary Kendrick and Roxanne Hart. Gary is one of the co-founders Directional HR and Ausdocs Online and has spent the last 30 years working for exchange listed organisations in the UK, US, Europe and for the last 14 years supporting businesses in Australia and Asia. Gary's passion is small and medium businesses, affording them with big business tools and capability at an affordable price. This has proven to be the case and is being extended with the partnership with Reckon Ausdocs. We are also joined by, by Roxanne Hart, the direct, uh, director of O Legal, a commercial law firm that provides cost-effective legal solutions for SMEs, as well as outsourcing services to law firms in Australia and overseas. Roxanne is an experienced commercial and corporate lawyer who practiced at one of the highest regarded law firms in Queensland for several years before starting O Legal. She advises small and medium and large businesses, ASX listed entities government bodies and non-for-profits. I will now hand you over to Gary for today's presentation. Thank you Charlotte and good afternoon to everybody that's uh, on the call. Um, so some of you might have joined us uh, a month ago or just over a month ago um, when we had uh, Brooke Pendlebury on the call who is a workplace lawyer and as you heard from um, Charlotte, we've got uh, Roxanne Hart or Roxy to her friends um, on the phone um, today for the uh, webinar. And uh, Roxy is one of our uh, legal um, experts of Ask an Expert that's online. So Reckon Docs. Um, for those of you that are, are new and haven't seen this before, um, I'll just go through a couple of slides quickly just to introduce you to Reckon Docs and, and what that is. So we have in excess of uh, 750 compliant legal documents um, covering SMEs, franchise, contractor businesses, HR, trusts, shareholders, partnerships, policies, checklists, everything that you could possibly want for um, an SME business or in fact if you're an in-house counsel that's something that you could use as well. Um, the good thing is you can go online to www.osdocsonline.com um, or via the Reckon link to Reckon Osdocs and select the document. You get immediate download so you can have it then and there or just wait for a couple of minutes and it will automatically uh, be emailed to you as a Word document um, and also send you a tax invoice. Um, so everything happens uh, within at least a, well, within a two minute time frame. Um, purchase of the documents or special packs is on a pay-as-you-go basis, so there's no minimums, no membership, no subscriptions or anything required. You can just take whichever document that you're looking for, download it, um, pay for it um, online and off you go. The next thing is we do have um, Ask an Expert on the front page of our website. And that's connection to uh, specific lawyers, so such as uh, Roxanne in the uh, commercial law environment, um, Brooke Pendlebury in the workplace environment, and we also have IR and HR experts. And you can purchase 15 minute consultations with those guys, um, anything between 75 and $115. Um, um, also on the site, you can get access to uh, business loans from $5,000 to $250,000, and that's via Prosper, and Prosper is Reckon Loans for those of you that know that. Okay, so we move on to the um, next slide. Um, just to let you know what's sort of up and coming fairly soon, so um, my slides will finish fairly quickly, and then we'll pass on to Roxanne. So we'll very soon have uh, Kiwi Docs online, so that's New Zealand specific content, um, that should be um, in the first half of this year. We'll also have wills online, uh, crafted and authored by uh, an Australian top 10 law firm. And they'll be about $50, something like that, but it's a, a very comprehensive um, service. But again, um, hugely reasonably priced. Um, police checks, so people checks, um, anti-money laundering checks, company searches, all of those things will be on um, hopefully by the end of this uh, first quarter, so by the end of March. And also um, starting a business um, will also 
um, become available. So you can have those company constitutions set up, ABNs, ACNs, all of those things will be able to be done online as well. And then finally, you will be able to create um, documents online. So if you had something like an employment contract, you would be able to enter the, the date, the salary, the person's name, address, any other details like that um, automatically online. It's a, a questionnaire that goes through. You can answer those questions and then it'll send you down your customized document. So really straightforward, really easy. And that, again, will be coming within the next uh, couple of months. OK, we move on to the next slide. Um, and it's really for me to um, introduce you to Roxanne Hart. As I said, Roxy to her friends. So hopefully you'll all become friends of Roxy by the end of this. Um, got a lot of information to share um, with um, SMEs, which is you know where we focus our business. Um, so I'll hand over to Roxy for the predominant of the presentation. Great. Thanks, Gary. And thanks for the introduction, Charlotte. So today we're going to be talking about a few new laws that have come into Australia in the past year or so and the opportunities that they present for businesses. So starting off with the new unfair contract terms laws, they present an opportunity for businesses to potentially get out of sticky contracts or to um, get out of nasty clauses that they don't like in their contracts. They're not that new. This came in at the very end of 2016, but it's only just started to be um, litigated in the court. So we're starting to get a few cases on the subject and um, it's quite interesting. So what it is, is you'll probably be aware that there's unfair, unfair contract term protection in Australia for consumers. So you know when, um, when businesses enter into contracts with consumers, if there's pretty unfair terms in those contracts, they've previously been void. And you would have seen examples of this with the banks and the airlines. Every so often we see them in the news and there's a case about you know this unfair term or unfair um, credit card pricing and things like that and that's generally deemed void so this is quite a big change in Australia was that those um, terms were extended to protect small businesses and they specifically apply to small business contracts which is a contract where the upfront price doesn't exceed 300 grand or if it's um, um, you know lasting for more than one year then the price doesn't exceed 1 million with being the price that's payable over the lifetime of that contract and at least one of the parties to the contract needs to be a small business, which is a business that employs fewer than 20 people. So what, what is actually an unfair term? It's a term that you know, causes significant imbalance between the parties, isn't re really reasonably necessary, and is going to cause detriment to one party if it is going to be relied on. So really, if you, I recommend a supply and gut feel test. If you're reading a contract and something sounds pretty one-sided or you know not, not very nice, the chances are it's going to be an unfair term. These unfair contract term protections only apply to standard form contracts. So that's important to note. It's um, really on those take it or leave it sort of contracts. Uh, you know, for example, if you're signing a contract with Jetstar, then obviously you're not going to really negotiate it very much. Um, you don't really have that much opportunity to do so anyway. So that's a standard form contract. But if the contract is going to be negotiated between the parties and there's a couple of rounds of legal review, then in that case, um, it's not really a standard form contract and these laws won't apply to it. So a recent example that we saw go through the courts, which gave a really good indication as to what is going to be found to be unfair, is in JJ Riches and Sons. So they had a contract and it had a total of 18 clauses. What happened though was eight of those clauses were deemed to be void recently. And examples of those uh, clauses were clauses which bound the customer to commit to future contracts unless they cancelled the initial contract within a very short period of time. So here, you know, you can see it was 30 days. That's not really a very long time. Let's say you've got a five-year contract. You might very easily miss that 30-day cancellation window and then you're stuck for another five years. So that's not okay. Uh, JJ Richards was able to unilaterally increase its prices. Again, not okay. Um, and then they had a very one-sided indemnity. So if something went wrong, they were saying, look, JJ Richards isn't liable under any circumstances, but um, the, customer, the business customer, they didn't have an equivalent uh, limitation of liability clause. You can have a look there at a few other ones that were unfair. One that I thought was pretty interesting was the exclusivity clause being deemed void. 
So JJ Richards had the exclusive rights to remove the waste from a customer's premises and that was found to be void. So what, what you should do about this is have a look through any contracts that you've entered into that you think probably fall within that standard form contract definition and consider whether any clauses that you don't like in there are unfair and potentially you'll be able to argue that they don't apply to you. So it might be a case where um, the other party has the right to increase the prices or there's automatic renewals and you've missed the mark or there's, um, you know, something goes wrong and, and there's no limitation of liability on your part. So there's a couple of opportunities there for businesses. And the other thing to think about is what to do about your existing contracts. So unfortunately, if you have unfair contract terms in your contracts that you're using with small businesses, they will probably be void. So what you should do now, though, is take a proactive approach and amend your standard templates to lessen the unfairness of those clauses. It doesn't mean that you can't keep them in there. It means you should probably just give the other party uh, more rights. So let's take the example of this uh, unilateral price increase. So if, you're, if you have a contract and you want to be able to increase the prices without consent of the other party, then you should put in there, okay, you can have this price increase, but then you need to give the other party the right to terminate the contract by giving you, say, 30 days notice after the price increase takes effect. So that just really reduces the unfairness of it. The next opportunity is that equity crowdfunding has finally been approved in Australia. This came in in late um, 2017 and is very exciting for the Australian startup scene. And ultimately what it enables startups to do is to raise small amounts of money from the public and in exchange for giving them shares. So previously the way that um, that equity funding in Australia worked was that you know you had to either list on the ASX or you could only raise money from sophisticated investors and you had to have a very long prospectus and it was all a very painful and red tape bound red tape um, process. So what this does is enables startups to raise money from the public and it gives the public an opportunity to invest in new ideas and new products as well so that they can benefit from the upside if it goes well. It enables companies to raise up to $5 million from investors each year. And there's a couple of rules that a company um, or a couple of eligibility requirements. They have to be unlisted, operating in Australia, have gross assets and annual, annual revenue of less than $25 million. And that would encompass the majority of businesses in Australia. So quite a few businesses are in a position to take advantage of this. And they're allowed to raise up to $10,000 from any one retail client. And they prepare a pretty simple, um, very watered down version of a prospectus. And then they go along to an AFSL licensee who's been authorized to do this crowdfunding activities. And then they get them to um, you know, review it and market it and you know, broker the deal. So there's been a couple of successful uh, crowdfunding businesses in Australia since this has come in, which is great to see, and we're expecting to see a lot more. So there's an opportunity here if your business has, say, a new product and you think it's going to go very well, but you don't have the capital to be able to uh, fund its development and then market it then this could be an option for you. Or if you know anybody, if your clients or your friends or your family are in the same sort of boat, then you could recommend that they have a look at this. So it's, it's been going really well overseas for a long time. So it's great to see it in Australia. And I'm sure that we'll see a lot more Australians taking advantage of this. And also it gives um, mum and dad investors the opportunity to get involved in new businesses as well. There's been uh, one small recent change to the PPSA recently. This is really one that applies if you are leasing uh, or leasing goods or giving them out on a bailment type of arrangement. So just a quick summary, as you're probably aware, what the PPSA does, it's a form of registering security interests or ownership of goods. So let's say you have um, an item of equipment and you're giving it to somebody uh, on, say, a hire arrangement, uh, and then that person 
goes bankrupt or, or if it's a company becomes insolvent, um, you could ultimately lose the ownership of your goods if you haven't complied with this regime and registered your security interest on the uh, relevant register. So this is, uh, this is a change that came in in the early 2000, around 2012. Uh, but unfortunately, there's been a lot of people who haven't complied with it and who have lost their goods. So what's happened was previously, if you were giving somebody equipment on, under a lease for a term of one year or more, then you had to do this registration. But if you failed to do that, then you could have lost your goods. So now they've increased it to two years. So that's um, quite a big change and means that a lot more businesses can be hiring out goods without worrying about complying with this. For example, I had a client um, I've been working with for a couple of years and he has a big piece of mining equipment. So obviously there's a lot of risk with miners um, suffering bankrupt, suffering insolvency events and people losing their goods all the time. So for him, we were always, have, every time he leased his goods out to these miners, we always had to register his PPS interest, even though the leases were only about one year or 18 months. So now what happens though, we don't need to worry about doing that and he can be comforted that his ownership is protected as long as his leases are going to be for less than two years, which normally they are. Okay, this is a subject that you've probably received a million emails about lately. I know that I have. So it's a new mandatory data breach reporting um, provisions that have come in into Australia in just the last week or so. So this one is very new. You need to be aware of how this might affect your business. So just quickly though, this applies to organisations where they have revenue in excess of three million per year. So that's going to um, catch quite a lot of organisations because it's not based on profit, it's just based on revenue. And what this is, as the name suggests, if there is a data breach suffered by the business, then they have to report that data breach to anybody who was affected by it, as well as the Australian Information Commissioner. And this is, relates to any data breaches which are likely to result in serious harm to the individual who it relates to. Uh, this, is, this coincides with what insurers have been labelling as the biggest risk for businesses and for directors for the past couple of years now, and that is um, cyber, cyber security. So as we all know, it's a, a really big issue in Australia and around the world. There's something like hundreds of um, data breaches happening to Australian organisations every day, and a lot of them we don't hear about. And they do happen to organisations that we give our details to, you know, like the banks um, and, and just various other ones, and we just don't hear about it because it wasn't mandatory. But now uh, we are going to be hearing about it. So this is going to have a big impact on businesses who don't have a good cyber protection. So, a a data breach occurs when those three things that are listed on the slide happen. And uh, serious harm, it, it can be really any sort of harm. So, you know, if somebody's credit card details are taken and then, you know, something um, is, is take, some of their money is taken, or if negative uh, private information about the person is taken and that's published and that causes them reputational harm, then all of these things are classified as serious harm and need to be notified. Importantly though, you don't have to notify if you have taken some sort of remedial action which has prevented um, the, the risk of serious harm occurring. So I've set out here just a, a quick little summary of the things you should do in the event that unfortunately you haven't notified a, a data breach. And what I suggest you do, these slides are going to be available later, but you can use this as a bit of a framework for a policy. So it's important to have a policy in place so that if a data breach happens, you know, you're not scrambling around wondering what to do, you actually have a policy in place which sets out exactly what you need to do. And this can um, be the difference between being able to contain a data breach very quickly and also show that, you know, you've, you've taken reasonable steps to mitigate the damage. Uh, suffering a lot of damage to your business and here's a couple of tips uh, just in general in relation to cyber security so you can take a bit more of a proactive approach and potentially eliminate the risk of what's happening to your business so you know things just using a strong or requiring it to be 90 days an independent um, permanent audit all of your security positions so your holes are, I can really save your mistakes 
because I've worked with quite a few organisations that are involving cyber security issues, you know, just things getting wiped and the effect is really accurate. And given the um, cyber burning every day, reality now, this could happen to anyone. Okay, the topic that I want to talk about is an issue that I see quite frequently in um, business, and it's where a contract a contractor is really an employee in disguise. I'm sure we've all had those situations where we've hired a contractor. Really, you probably knew in the back of your mind that you're an employee. Um, you're worried about the contract. There are quite a lot of consequences. So at some point to make that it, it's illegal to decide an employee as a contractor and um, there's a big fine attaches to it and if the employee gets, well, the contractor employee gets the employee under the Fair Work Act. So those dismissal and certain insurance insurances that you might not have had for them um, could actually be revoked. But it's something to be aware of. There is, like like everything, unfortunately, there is no clear-cut test which says an employee and the contractor. What we have is a variety of So what I'm going to do, uh, we'll go second all the answers that could point to somebody being a contractor or an employee. So what I think you should do is have a think about your workforce at the moment. Okay, is um, is this person contractor that I've hired or are going to be an employee? An employee, you now. Uh, this, this is your opportunity to fix the situation and maybe turn back into a contractor or offer them a normal employment contract. Go through those factors. I'll just tell you a practical. Uh, a couple of days ago, I was working with a doctor and he had a, a contractor with a medical practice. So, in reality, um he was required to work to the hours that the medical practice set for him. He asked for changes every now and again to the roster, which they pretty much ignored. Uh, he was guaranteed a minimum base salary of 110 grand a year. He also had a minimum hourly rate guaranteed to him. Um, he was paid basically a percentage of the billings that he earned. He had to have he had to himself pay his own superannuation and his own insurance. Uh, the practice gave him a few a, a few pieces of equipment to use, but he also had to supply some himself. Uh, and he was banned from working for any other organisation, so it was an exclusive arrangement. And um, yeah, he was working essentially full time hours. So the question was, was he a contractor or was he an employee? So going through these um, these factors here, so degree of control over how his work was performed. Uh, he obviously the doctor could decide how to how to diagnose people, but he was really under the direction of the employer as to which of the employer's practices he went to work at. So sometimes he had to go to an aged care home, sometimes he was told to go to some other facility or hospital or whatever, and then sometimes the practice. But the employer decided that. Next one is the hours of work. So he he worked pretty standard hours, and he was also um, required to work full time hours. So that's that's pretty uh, indicative of a person being an employee. The expectation of work. Uh, in this case, he was actually locked in uh, to work for them for at least two years, and then he had a really long notice period if he wanted to quit. So that that again looks a bit like an employee because if he was a contractor, normally what happens is the practice would contact him and say, look, we've got work on today. Um, do you want to take it? Yes or no? And there's no obligation to do it. But in this case, there was an expectation that it show up every day. Uh, the risk. So in this case, he didn't really bear any financial risk because he had that minimum guaranteed salary. Again, looks a bit like an employee, whereas with a contractor, um, there, there is no set amount that they're going to earn per year. Superannuation. In this case, he was paying his own. So it looks like a contractor. Tools and equipment. It was it was a bit of both. So let's let's just say he was a contractor for that. Um, tax. He was paying his own tax and remitting GST. Method of payment. Uh, in this case, he was paid fortnightly every Wednesday. Again, looks a bit like an employee. 
and this one is important. In, the, in this case, he was actually given um, paid annual leave and paid sick leave. And they actually used those terms in his contract. So again, that, that's very indicative of a person being an employee because as we know, contractors don't get this entitlement. So on the whole, uh, we advised him, look, it looks like you're an employee. Um, it's a sham contract. So you could potentially be able to get out of your contract on that basis. Uh, and then there was a few other implications for the employer. So we'll see what ultimately happens. But that's just um, a good example of a pretty common thing that employees in Australia do. So something to be aware of. And as I said before, I recommend that you have a look through your current uh, contractor arrangements and just have a look through this checklist as well and decide, okay, are they really an employee? And then take the opportunity now to address it. So I hope that that information was helpful. Just a quick summary of the key takeaways um, that you should go away with from this presentation. The first one is having a look at all your existing contracts to see if there's any unfair terms in there and then see what you can do now about reducing the unfairness of them. Uh, the second one is reviewing any contracts that you've entered into that you, uh, you know, you're unhappy with some of the terms in there, might be a nasty clause which enables the other party to increase the fees or, you know, might just put all the liability, on, liability onto you and see if you can get out of a sticky situation. This one is that crowdsourced equity funding regime. So have a think about whether there's any, um, any projects that you're working on at the moment in your business or it might be something your business wanted to do uh, and decide whether that could be a way to raise some funds for that. The PPS lease change, I said that it's now only, only applies to two year leases. So that's pretty handy um, in saving you some compliance costs if you are a person who leases equipment. The data breaches regime, you should um, definitely have a look at creating a policy to deal with that. And also I haven't added it here, but you should also look at um, creating a policy that's a bit more proactive about minimizing your cyber security risk. And while I mentioned it, there is also insurance for cyber security risk in Australia. So that's something to have a look at and check your existing policies to see if it does cover cyber breaches. Because some your, your insurance actually might already cover it. I see quite a few policies that do automatically cover it, which is great. And then the last one is, yeah, having a look at your contractor arrangements and checking if they're employees. Okay, well, I hope that uh, that was informative. And yeah, if you have any questions, we're gonna take questions at the end, but I'll now pass back over to Gary. I think we're just gonna wrap it up for us. Lovely, thanks indeed, um, Roxy. Um, really, really good. And uh, there was a couple of things that uh, I personally picked out of that as well, um, especially the one to do with the uh, contractor versus um, employee, um, something I might actually phone my own daughter on and just to advise her. So uh, thank you for that um, free piece of advice. Um, so just <laughs> in, to, to, <laughs> just to um, uh, finalise the sort of uh, the presentation before we go on to any questions that have come through, and I know um, Charlotte's got a couple because uh, she sent me a little note and said a couple have come through. Um, the uh, privacy policy, including the breach notification, um, which was um, the 22nd of uh, February uh, when that came in in Australia, um, is available online now um, and it's only $44. So just be aware of that. You know, you don't need one per person or anything like that. It is just a, a policy for the business and um, you can have that and make it available. I copy it to um, employees within the business so that they're aware um, of any um, actions that they need to take if they become aware um, of a data breach. So again, just a, a key thing there, when we were talking about aiming everything that we do um, at SMEs and being really proactive in that environment, uh, that kind of example, and um, you know, $44 is sort of what we're aiming at. Um, a couple of the other ones, and it really just covers off really what um, Roxy was talking about. So the contractors agreement, now on there you will see short form and long form. Um, basically the difference between the two is you get more clauses in one than you do in the other. They're both exactly the same price. So, you know, if you think you only need something, you know, fairly short just because it's, you know, for a couple of days or something like that, um, you might just use the short form. Or if it's a little bit more and uh, an important project or the sums of money 
uh, involved are a little bit higher, um, then the long form uh, will have more clauses to cover more uh, eventuality and issues. So for a company contractor, there's one or an individual contractor, they're all exactly the same, $90. So it doesn't matter whether it's a, an employment contract or a part-time um, uh, employee, a trainee, anything like that, um, they're all uh, priced at $90. Um, and then finally, you've got the connection to the lawyers and HR experts, and you will note on there, um, if you click on uh, the site, on the Ask an Expert, um, you'll see commercial lawyer, and that commercial lawyer um, that you will gain access to um, is Roxanne. So don't worry that you'll get anyone else. You won't if you go through on the uh, commercial lawyer, um, it will be Roxanne that will be responding to you. So, um, and the key thing there really again, um, and when we put the pricing on there, of the spacing and, and each different um, professional has a different cost. Um, the key thing is that you can ask all the questions that you want. You can send them an email with the contracts or uh, issues that you've got with existing contracts where, you know, you might think you have clauses in your contract that you think are unfair or clauses in contracts that you've got from others that you think are unfair. Um, once you um, purchase that 15 minute consultation, uh, an email goes through to Roxy to advise that you've done that. Um, and then uh, she will respond with an email address where you can then uh, attach copies of contracts, ask the questions, you get that quarter for an hour. If you need more, you can go and purchase another 15 minutes. And then Roxy can help you and say, okay, well, this is what you need to do and this is what needs to happen. Um, and then you can go from there. The key thing is that you're in control of the spend. So it's not, I need you to review these seven contracts and then you get a bill for X dollars. Um, you will know in advance because you'll be able to talk to them for the 15 minutes and know in advance what the cost will be um, to action your request. So really, really good. And again, the documents, uh, all of those that are above, they're all on a pay-as-you-go basis. No memberships, no fees, no subscriptions or anything such as that. Um, there's the uh, link that you can go through to. So www.reckon.com slash au slash ausdocs and you can get through. Um, so I encourage you all to do that. And the other thing I'll mention now um, for all those people that are on the call is the uh, next webinar um, with Roxy will be on Tuesday the 20th of March at 2 p.m. Um, and covering uh, another variety of topics uh, specifically aimed at SMEs. So if you found today's uh, 45 minutes that it will be, uh, hopefully with some questions, um, interesting, um, please do sign up in the way that you usually do with the uh, Reckon Training Academy for Tuesday the 20th of March at um, two o'clock. So if we move on to the next slide, I think you'll find that um, it's the questions. So if anybody has put those online, um, I'll hand over to Charlotte to see if any have uh, come through or if any of you want to type them in the, um, the box, then uh, feel free to do so. So uh, back to you, Charlotte. Thanks so much, Gary. And thanks, Roxanne, for your presentation as well. Uh, we have received a few queries. Um, the first one, do Ausdocs do website audits? Oh, um, the answer is, um, yeah, <laughs> insightful, I think is the word. Um, yes, we will be doing uh, exactly that. So um, it isn't something that is online at the moment, but we are hoping within the next six weeks that that will be something that people can purchase online, um, where someone will look at your website. So it's things like terms and conditions, returns, policy, um, any of the sort of small print that's associated with a website to make sure that you're covered with the activities that you're making. Um, so yes, that will be something that will be available hopefully in about the next six to eight weeks. Um, so uh, please go on to the site and then if you type website audit um, at one point in time in six to eight weeks that should come up. So um, yes. Uh, insightful, but uh, thank you for the question, whoever it was. Okay, thank you, Gary. Another question. Um, it's saying I need to set up an account. Is there a cost for this? Uh, this is on on the uh, Reckon Ausdocs? 
yeah on the website yeah okay um yes yeah, so th there is no cost so that's the first thing as we said this is purely you're purchasing um the agreement there is no membership sign-ups anything like that the only reason we ask you to set up an account is so that we get uh, an email and a name uh, and therefore we can actually send through the tax invoice um, so that's the key for setting up an account um, the other thing is if you do tick the box that says um, allow marketing um, we don't actually market but what we do is send out information so things like the um, data breach um, legislation that came through that came into effect on the 22nd of February this year um, we would send out a note to everybody to just let them know that that's coming out again that it does only apply to businesses um, and the key word here is with turnover of three million and you know not worried about the profit um, that was important so that's the kind of information that we send out but no there is no cost for setting up an account thanks Gary um, another question, do you have policy packs available for small businesses, as I cannot see this on your site? Okay, um, it currently isn't on the site, but it is something that we're putting together. In fact, we're doing some work with a couple of accounting firms and with uh, Reckon um, to actually look at the policies that should be standard um, compliance um, policies that a small business should have. So we're going to, um, again, within the next six to eight weeks, there will be um, a pack up on site. It sounds like I've set these questions up. Um, there will be um, two packs up on site, so sort of a half pack and a full pack. Um, so they're, they're the must, must haves and the really good to haves. Um, so those will be two packs that'll be up. And again, what we'll do um, when we put the policy packs together is um, provide a discount between 15 and 20 percent so if people do purchase a pack um, they do basically get you know one in five um, for free so that's what again we will be putting together so um, again um, sounds like someone's on the call that knows our business very well so um, thank you indeed for the uh, question thanks Gary uh, we've also received some queries around um the presentation slides and a recording of today's webinar just to let everyone know that a copy of the slides with the recording will be available on our reckon training academy i can send a link to anyone that's inquired for that to um to enroll into the online version of this course um there haven't been any other questions submitted i'm not sure if anyone would like to submit something now while we have a little while before the end if there's maybe anything you would like to add, Gary or Roxanne, while we wait for any more questions? Um, no, not from my side. I mean, the, the key thing, I suppose, is just that, um, again, if people did find it interesting, um, the, the sort of detail that's gone through, and they want more information, you can go on the site, click on the Ask an Expert, and don't forget that you'll get um, some more insights um, into um, a legal perspective of um, information that is very useful to SMEs, again from Roxy at the next one, um, as I say, that's on uh, March the 20th at, um, again, at two o'clock. So if people do, um, you know, want to subscribe to that, then go to the usual site um, and you'll be able to log on and um, we'll be able to chat to you then. Um, I will apologise in advance that the uh, couple of slides at the beginning will be fairly similar, but hopefully some of the things that I spoke about um, just now in answer to those questions, um, I might be able to say um, are not coming, uh, they've actually arrived. So um, hopefully I'll be able to uh, get some of those um, to market a little bit quicker. But um, no, I haven't got anything else to add. Um, Roxy, from yourself? No, I'm all good, thanks. Sure, we just received one more question here. Um, how long until your packs will be available, i.e. small business packs? Okay, um, I, um, I'll i try and make a commitment to everybody on the call um, to have those up by um, the end of next week. So I will have some policy packs up um, and then we will be putting together, as I say, it is working. Um, in fact, I have a call um, tomorrow morning at 11 o'clock um, with uh, the Reckon uh, Directorate. Um, with regards to what they would like included in um, a small business pack. Um, so we'll be putting those up, but I will commit to everybody that by um, next Friday, 
um, I will have um, the two policy packs online, so the half pack and the full pack. Um, so if I can't get somebody to do it, I will actually do it myself. That's great. Thanks so much, Gary. And um, we might just end the session there as there's been no more questions submitted. Um, as I said, there will be a recording available on our Reckon Training Academy, which you can access from reckon.com in the training area. And that's the same area where you can also uh, register for the next upcoming webinar in the series. Uh, thanks again, Gary and Roxanne, for presenting today. And we'll hope to see everyone at the next webinar. Thanks, everyone. Thank you. Thank you. Bye bye.